Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Whitefish Point in the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum. My name is Bruce Lynn. I'm the Executive Director of the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society. And as we start tonight, I'd like to just take a moment to welcome everybody who's with us, both uh, all of you that are here in person at Whitefish Point and everybody who's tuning in uh, via live stream here tonight. And uh, we have a number of people I know down at the Michigan Maritime Museum in South Haven that are joining us as well. So thank you again, everybody, for being a part of this event tonight. Uh, each year, November the 10th, we, we take some time to remember uh, the Edmund Fitzgerald, of course, and more importantly, the 29-man crew uh, that was on board that ship. There are any number of ways today that people can learn about the Fitzgerald itself and its story. There are books that have been written. Uh, there are documentaries that are out there. Uh, there's just any number of ways. But I think all of us are probably aware that there's really reason why uh, more people know about the Fitzgerald. We have about a dozen shipwrecks represented uh, from three of the Great Lakes. Uh, but there's one that really most people come to learn about. Uh, and often for us, the staff here at the Shipwreck Museum, we can talk about the Edmund Fitzgerald, but this also becomes a conduit or a way for us also to talk about all these other shipwrecks. And think about that for a minute. 6,000 shipwrecks possibly on the Great Lakes. Some statistics tell us about 10,000 shipwrecks on the Great Lakes. And really, for the most part, those stories are not as well known as that of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And there really, again, is one reason for that. Uh, if you take a look at the panels, at least everybody that's with us here tonight, that you can just see to my immediate right, you can see uh, a panel that talks about the Carl Bradley. That was a shipwreck in 1958, uh, Northern Lake, Michigan. Uh, there were two survivors from that shipwreck and one only passed away a few years ago and he actually did a few programs inside the gallery. Uh, the other one beside it is a 1966 shipwreck, the Daniel J. Morrell, uh, Lake Huron. Uh, there was one survivor, a man by the name of Dennis Hale. These were amazing stories of survival, at least in, in those instances. But again, people really, the general public, were not aware of these shipwrecks. And I'll go back to what I just said twice now. There was a big reason for that. There wasn't someone like Gordon Lightfoot that wrote a song about those shipwrecks. And that really is going to be the focus here tonight uh, for us to think a little bit about Gordon Lightfoot and what he did to make you know the uh, public aware of the shipwreck and to tell the story. Uh, Mike is going to talk about this uh, in detail and he's gonna have plenty of time tonight to talk about how that song was conceived, how it was written, how it was performed. And of course, they're gonna be performing as well. By the way, let's let's give uh, the Gordon Lightfoot tribute a round of applause here for, for being here and being such great musicians. Mm. Mike hears this every year, but I talk about how, uh, you know, in prior years, the Gordon Lightfoot tribute, Mike Forns and his group, they were the Gordon Lightfoot approved Gordon Lightfoot tribute band. And people often would get Mike in particular confused with Gordon Lightfoot, the man. Mike told me this, you know, one year before we were about to start this event. And uh, I, I kind of believed it, but I wasn't so sure. And someone approached him and asked for an autograph. This was in the foyer of the museum because they thought we actually had Gordon Lightfoot here uh, for the event. So it tells you uh, that Mike wasn't too far off when people sometimes might have confused him for Gordon Lightfoot himself. So we will talk about Gordon a lot tonight. Uh, many of us here at the museum and, and really a number of the Fitch Gerald family members that are here tonight uh, were able to be here on November the 9th, 20, 2015. I think a lot of us will remember that when uh, Mr. Lightfoot paid us a visit here at the museum. And uh, it was interesting to be able to watch him uh, walking around with uh, the Edmund Fitzgerald surviving family members that were here that day. Uh, I found that he had a great interest in what we did here at the museum. And this told you about the man a little bit because he was asking us more questions about what we did at the museum and how we got into this kind of work than we were really getting much of a chance ask him about his career and everything he had done. So it was really uh, quite a visit and it was it was quite a moment for all of us uh, here at the museum. So with that, um, I'm going to read an excerpt from a, a book called Gales of November. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this book. If you've ever written it, written it or read it rather, uh, this book came out in 1981. 
And it was one of the first books to pay a little bit more attention to the crew members themselves and to the families as well and tell some of the backstories. Um, it's, a, it's a really well-written book and it's, it presents a little bit of a different history. But I think in the preface of this book, it does a very good job of summarizing Gordon Lightfoot's impact on the public awareness and consciousness about this story and about this shipwreck. Shortly after seven o'clock on the night of November the 10th, 1979, the 729 foot straight deck ore freighter Edmund Fitzgerald sank during a violent storm on Lake Superior. It had happened suddenly, some say as quickly as 10 seconds. One instance, she was plowing through waves as high as a three story building. Next, she had been swallowed by the treacherous lake which bears the ominous sobriquet, the graveyard of ships. The following day, word had flashed around the world, telling of the ship's sudden and mysterious disappearance from the radar screens of several nearby vessels and of the apparent loss of the Fitzgerald's entire 29-man crew. News of the sinking was carried in the press, on radio, on television, throughout the country on November the 11th. The news segments of NBC's Today Show mentioned the loss. Walter Cronkite briefly noted it on the CBS Evening News that day. ABC and NBC reported the sinking on their evening news broadcasts. The New York Times carried a front page story on the tragedy at hundreds of other daily newspapers. Newsweek and Time magazines also made mentions of the Fitzgerald's foundering. And then the disaster was qu quickly forgotten by practically everyone. Within a few days, the loss of the ship had apparently faded from the minds of seemingly all but the families and friends of the 29 men who had sailed on their deaths aboard the Fitzgerald. It was not too surprising that the sinking of a huge ship had little impact on the public at that time. To most people, a ship, even one 700 feet in length, being lost on the lakes was tantamount to a rowboat foundering in a duck pond. Most Americans who've never seen them think of the Great Lakes as little more than knee-deep pools few fully comprehend the awesome size of what has been called the world's eighth sea or the dangers faced by those who sail upon these often cruel and bellicose waters. Small wonder then that the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald sustained no lasting relevance in the lives of the public. But then a strange thing happened. In midsummer of 1976, about nine months following the Fitzgerald's disappearance, Canadian folk singer and composer Gordon Lightfoot released a record album titled Summertime Dream. The haunting melody of one, one selection from the album, with its almost dirge-like quality and strange, mournful whining, like the whistling through a ship's rigging, quickly attracted attention. Radio stations throughout the Great Lakes area began receiving dozens of telephone calls each day, asking the selection to be played. Record shops quickly sold out of their supply of the album. Within a few weeks, a wave of interest in the song had swept beyond the Great Lakes region and had engulfed the entire nation with a rare fascination that was not limited to devotees of Lightfoot's esoteric musical style. Warner Brothers Records, producers of the album, responded to this interest by releasing a single, a 45 RPM record of the song. Demand for the record continued to increase and before the first anniversary of the sinking of the Fitzgerald, Lightfoot's record had made its way to the top of the popular music charts. The song was titled, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Lightfoot had succeeded in acquainting a large portion of the public with the Great Lakes as something more than a, a small, calm lagoons in which to splash in the heat of the summer and was able to tell the story of terror and death during a furious November storm on Lake Superior. I think that summarizes it very nicely. And we're going to spend a little more time tonight focusing again on Gordon Lightfoot's contributions to the awareness of the shipwreck. And uh, with that, I'm going to introduce Father Bob Aldridge for the invocation. Let us join in, join in prayer. Gentlemen, please remove your cover. Almighty God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast in our eternal home, and makes the mighty waters deep, their appointed limits keep, 
and whose arm has calmed the restless wave. O oh, hear us when we call on thee for those who rest in superior's inner sea. We ask your blessing on us this, as we gather this night to recall and honor the merchant mariners who were serving upon the MV Edward Fitzgerald at the time of her fatal voyage and began the journey to eternity for their efforts on this vessel and therefore have been committed to the deep of Lake Superior. We ask that you receive our prayers on the behalf of the souls of your servants who are now in the fellowship of your saints. We further seek your blessing upon those who offer this tribute in honor of those for whom the bell tolls. O Lord God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Thank you, Father Bob. Each year during this event, we bring forward a different story, uh, a different aspect of the history of the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Often it is someone who had a connection uh, either with the ship itself or maybe perhaps was out on the lake that night. Uh, last year, we had a gentleman by the name of George Bratz that joined us. He was a reporter with the Toledo Blade uh, back in the early 70s and was able to, well, he came up with the story himself of writing an article about life on the Great Lakes being on a ship. And that was his ticket to get on board a ship. He didn't know exactly which ship it was, but it ended up being the Edmund Fitzgerald. And it ended up being mostly the crew uh, that we're, we're talking about here tonight that he ended up spending some time with. Uh, the year before that, we had a gentleman by the name of Bob Baxter, who was a first assistant engineer on a ship called the L.E. Block that was out in Whitefish Bay on the night of November the 10th, 1975, and him sharing some of his experiences and what, what happened that evening. And the year before that, we even had two gentlemen, uh, Mike Zronick and Tony Hall, who are with us here tonight, that were on board the Woodrush uh, as it made its way across Lake Superior to the last known position of the Edmund Fitzgerald. So we, we try to bring a different story, but this year we felt that, that absolutely it was going to be uh, even more appropriate to bring to light and share more of the story of the song and how much it did to create this awareness. So with that, I'll introduce Mike Forns of the Gordon Lightfoot Tribute. Thank you, Bruce. I am not Gordon Lightfoot. <laughs> um, as the role that I have, as Gordon told me, this is in his words, Michael, now you're a pinch hitter. Uh, the first year that I uh, did this, which was 14 years ago now, uh, Gordon told me that, and I just thought, what an honor. I mean, if he can't be here to sing the song that he wrote, I could sing it for him, for all of you. And over the years, uh, we've had many chances to meet so many wonderful people. But it's there's no question that through this haunting ballad, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, more people know of the events of November 10th, 1975 than anything else. There would be people in this room that certainly would know of it of other ways. But for most of us, we heard it on the radio, we heard it on record album, we heard it on a cassette, maybe an eight track, then we went to a CD, and we're still getting it, listening to it by streaming it. But Gordon said that he was upstairs on the third floor of his Toronto home writing music that night. He happened to be fixed on an old Irish dirge that he recalled hearing during his childhood when he was about three and a half years old. It was only four chords. He had no real reason to be playing it. It just was in his mind, and that's what was being strummed on his 12-string guitar that night. 
At the time, he was working on a new album that became Summertime Dream. It was going to be an important record. It was the follow-up to Gord's Gold that was such a huge hit. I don't know if you remember Gord's Gold. It had If You Could Read My Mind, Sundown, Rainy Day People, Canadian Railroad Trilogy, Cotton Jenny, Steel Rail Blue. It goes on and on. It had all of his greatest hits. And the record company said, Gord, you need to come up with another big one while the momentum is here. You know, capitalize on that. At one point later that evening, Gord went downstairs for a cup of coffee and noticed that it was really windy. The 11 p.m. CBC News was on the television and carried a brief report of the ship sinking during a vicious storm on Lake Superior. And as windy as it was in Toronto, Gordon could only imagine how bad it must have been on Lake Superior. And they had a picture in that news report. And he noted the name and how it was spelled. Edmund Fitzgerald, E-D-M-U-N-D. Two weeks went by, very little else was heard about it, but he did read something in a Toronto newspaper that referred to the ship as the Edmund Fitzgerald, E-D-M-O-N-D. He had seen a picture of the ship with its name on its side. And he thought, how could somebody print a story about this ship where 29 men died and they don't even spell the name of the ship right? That really bothered him. That really did. The tragedy attracted some news coverage in the Great Lakes states, got a brief mention on national network TV news and mirrored his stories in, in several publications, including Newsweek magazine. That told the story of the sinking of the Fitzgerald, and it was the Newsweek piece that provided most of the factual material that Lightfoot included in the song. And by assembling news clippings and the Newsweek story and getting everything in chronological order, over a few weeks, the lyrics began to be scribbled on a legal pad. The Newsweek article started out by saying, that on the fury of the Great Lakes is the title of this little piece, and it talked about how on the big lake that the Chippewa tribe called Gitchigumi was a lake that never gives up or dead. Have we heard those words before? That's where Gordon got the opening line from the song, was right from that article. Another thing that struck Gord was a reference in that article that talked about the gales of November. Nobody had ever really coined that phrase. And here it was in writing, and Gord thought, wow, the gales of November. This is something that has happened more than once over the years. There are lots of bad storms on Lake Superior. In fact, Gordon has said that originally he thought that would be the name of this song. He was going to... I'm going to call it The Gales of November. That would be the name of this song. But as time went on, he started to think differently about it. He became fascinated with the history of this ship and the history of the men that were on it. And during rehearsals for Summertime Dream in January of 1976, Lightfoot already had 22 songs that he was considering for the new album. Some great songs. The title track, Summertime Dream, Never Too Close, The House You Live In, Protocol, I'm Not Supposed to Care, Spanish Moss, Never Too Close. I love to play those songs in concert. There's some great tunes. It's probably my favorite Lightfoot album, actually. But 22 songs, because the record company said you can only have 10. The record company wanted these 10. The producer, of the record wanted these 10. The guys in Gord's band decided these 10 were the ones to put on the record album. And Gord wanted these 10. It was a negotiation to try and figure out which songs and in what order they would be played. Do you remember record albums? We had five songs on one side. We turn it over, play the other five songs. It's the way it went. Barry Keane, Lightfoot's drummer for many years, 
told me that at the end of that first day recording Summertime Dream, where they already had the 10 songs picked out, they were settled now, Gord started playing the chords to a song nobody in the band recognized. He said it was about a shipwreck on Lake Superior. In the next rehearsal, he was strumming it again. And by the third rehearsal, his lead guitarist, the late Terry Clements, asked how the song would begin. Gord replied, come up with something. He would do that a lot. He would rely on Terry to come up with something to start the song or to provide a little interlude in the middle of the song. And oftentimes what Terry would do was play the vocal line. He would just play that on his guitar and that would work out pretty good. Well, over the next few rehearsals, when they'd finished recording other songs they'd prepared, the other players began adding ideas for the song. Rick Haynes, the bass player, thought maybe he could contribute some bass that sounded like thunder rumbling. Peter Charles, the pedal steel player, questioned, how did this ship sink? Was it in a collision? No, it was in a big storm, two big storms actually that came together. Well, maybe it could play something on the pedal steel guitar that would kind of sound like an eerie wind sound, you know. Gord thought that would be okay. They began adding these ideas, and Gord thought, yeah, you could do that. Yeah, you could do that. But this new song wouldn't be on this album. Gord was just fooling around with it at this point. In February, the band went to Toronto's Eastern Sound Studios to begin recording. There was a lot of haggling in the, within the band and the record company as to which order the songs would be in, because it had to make sense in a certain way for marketing purposes, you see. Four days in, Gord keeps fooling around with this new song that is not going to be on the album. It's 3 o'clock, and the album is supposedly finished. They're all done, but they've got some studio time left. The engineer says, why don't you use the remaining time and play that new song that you've been fooling around with for a couple of weeks. They played it, two verses of it. The guys said, what do we do? We've never heard the song. He said, we're just going to do what you've been fooling around with. Just follow me. We're just going to repeat. It kind of repeats itself over and over, verse after verse. So jump in and play what you think needs to be played. Well, they played two verses, and Gordon stopped them. No, no, no. It's, it's too fast. Slow it down. It's got to have some feeling. It's got to have some soul to it. Let's try it again. They were ready to go again. And at that point, Barry Keen said, Gord, do I get to be on this? Are there drums in this song? And Gord said, yeah, I'll give you a nod when to come in. <laughs> not play the cymbal, not start out with a snare drum, not hit the tom-toms a certain way. Just I'll nod to you when to come in. Feel it. Just follow us, you know. I mean, who does that, right? Well, they played the song, and after the second verse, Gordon nodded, and Barry came in with the drums, and they got all the way through at that time. Terry Clements told me, he said to Gordon, sheesh, that gave me a shiver up my spine. The guys just looked at each other. They said, Gordon, you, you might have a hit here. This is really, really something. The engineer on the other side of the glass said, do you want to hear it back again? They said, you mean you, you recorded it? He said, well, you've been fooling around with it for two weeks. I thought if you were going to play it all the way through, I'd roll tape. So they listened to it. And as much as they liked hearing that playback, they thought maybe this should get some consideration to be on the record, despite the producer saying, no, 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 we're, we're all set. We've got the 10 songs now, you know. Well, the record company agreed to listen to it. 
Well, they worked on it for two weeks to get a demo ready to where they could play it for the record company to try to impress the record company to put it on the album. You know, they fooled around with that for those two weeks and tried time and time again to re-record it for the demo. And they could never get it to sound the same way that it sounded the first time they played it through. A first take was exactly what they wanted. The guys in the band had never heard the words, and they just joined in and played along. You don't make records that way. Summertime Dream came out in May of 1976, and it got positive reviews. And listeners began to learn about the shipwreck that happened on November the 10th, 1975, the year before. The song was originally more than six minutes long, and AM radio programmers didn't even want to think about playing something that long. All the music that a lot of us grew up with were songs that lasted two and a half, three minutes, three and a half maybe, because radio stations wanted to get in the most commercials they could in an hour of time. So a long song was just going to take up time that could be money coming in, income. They wanted short songs. Some of the Beatles stuff was two and a half, 225, and they were big hits. That's what radio stations wanted. Well, Gordon wouldn't hear of shortening it. He didn't want to change the lyrics. He refused to do it. And they wound up making a single recut for a 45 RPM. Remember the 45s? They were about this big, you know. You had to put a thing in the middle to make it fit on the turn. Yeah, remember that. And when they did, they cut out 35 seconds of Terry Clement's lead guitar licks in between verses. It's that haunting sound that we know about the song. And that was removed. And that was played on a lot of AM radio stations. The album track has always had the original version that was six minutes and 10 seconds long. By November, almost a year to the day, when Lightfoot first heard about the ship going down, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald hit number one on Canada's RPM charts, number one on the American cash box chart, and number two on the Billboard chart, making it his most successful single after sundown. It was the number one song in Canada in 1976 on their radio stations. But it wasn't number one that year in the United States. It was number two in our country. The number one song that year in America, Barry Manilow's I Write the Songs. Sometimes it works out that way. The Hot 100 featured more rock and roll type music on it. And Gordon's song was number two there as well. The number one song on the Hot 100, you might remember, Rod Stewart, Tonight's the Night. Number one song there, some people. He always had empathy for the family members who had lost their men in that terrible storm. And I understand that he wrote letters to many family members, and he never wanted the song to offend them. He always wanted it to be something that they remembered in a, in a good way. Of course, over the years, Ruth Hudson and Cheryl Rosman and some others let Gord know that that line, at 7 p.m., a main hatchway caved in, made it sound like their men were at fault for not securing hatch covers. That line came from a report by the U.S. Coast Guard that one of the reasons the ship sank was due to leaking hatch covers. The National Transportation Safety Board agreed. But about 15 years ago, 
a Canadian television program called Dive Detectives ran a segment about the Fitzgerald with video coverage back in the day when you could still record video at the, at the site. And it showed that the ship was broken in two pieces. And they ran a simulation with a model of the ship in high seas that proved the amount of water that was in the ship's hull could not possibly have come from leaking hatch covers. Why did the ship sink precisely? We still don't know that. But a lot of water came from down below that probably caused this tragedy. The producer of that program brought a laptop computer to Gordon's office on Young Street in Toronto and asked to see him and put the laptop on Gordon's desk and said, watch this. And Gordon saw that and he was absolutely astonished because he put that line in the song based on the information that we had at the time. At the time it was thought it was due to leaking hatch covers. And at 7 p.m., the hatchway caved in. Well, that's what was known at the time or thought to be known. Gord was troubled by that. And ever since, he performed the song live with a different phrase. Can't change the record, but live, he would sing at 7 p.m. It grew dark. It was then. This is his empathy for the families. He wanted it to be as accurate as he could be. Of course, the Reverend Richard Ingalls once invited Gord to come and visit the Mariner's Church in Detroit after a show that Gordon did in Detroit. And the Reverend Ingalls got to see him and ask him to come over and visit the church. He said, you really should come over and see our church, Gordon. It's really quite nice inside. It's not a musty old hall at all, you know. <laughs> Make fun of somebody or place blame. Gordon changed that too. All detail. But now in not a musty one even though he read in the Newsweek article that the Mariner's Church at the time in 1975 was a 126-year-old stone church. You might think it might be a little musty in there, but the Reverend Ingalls said no, so Gordon changed that. Right up until his death, Gordon Lightfoot maintained a relationship with the surviving families and annually donates scholarship funding to the Great Lakes Maritime Academy in Traverse City, Michigan. Both Thomas Benson and David Weiss, crew members, were cadets at the time, at that time at the Great Lakes Maritime Academy. In our tribute, we also sing the song with those changes of the lyrics in respect to the families and to Gordon. We owe a lot to the song, and we owe a lot to Gordon. It's our privilege to stand in for Gord at an event like this. We all know what November storms are like on the lakes, and the Shipwreck Museum is a very special place to us. So in conclusion, I'd like you to know that when Gordon passed on May the 1st, I heard from an awful lot of people that wanted to express their feelings about losing this great songwriter and composer. But since then, I have learned that Gord did make it to the pearly gates. And when he got there, St. Peter was waiting at the podium and said, Gord, come on in, bring your guitar. We've got 29 men up here from a ship that are pretty anxious to meet you. Thank you, Mike, very much. And I'm glad that we didn't have to rush that story this time, too. Okay, we're coming to the part of the program this evening where we do the call to the last one. Uh, 
I think many of you are aware in the audience uh, a little bit of the story behind the law on how it came. It is really the central part. This bell was arrived, and there are a few of you in the audience here I know tonight that were with us when the first time this bell uh, was told in, in Sault Ste. Marie itself, uh, and it was July. Uh, and we might often expect weather to be nicer in July, but Mother Nature didn't have that in mind. We had dark skies, we had high winds, we had a tent that was almost blown over in the process, and the bell didn't look exactly like it now. It didn't look like that. And Because it had just the bell was recovered under the direction of my predecessor, a man by the name of Tom Farnquist. It was the Royal Canadian Navy, Sony Corporation, and National Geographic teaming up with the Shipwreck Society to recover this bell. And there's a few other parts of this story I'm going to share uh, towards the end of the evening. But With that, I'm going to introduce well, congratulations on that and thank you for being with us here this evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and thanks again to the Shipwreck um, Museum for inviting myself and my crew and um, the fellow Coasties that we have with us today. Um, again, this is such an honor. John H. McCarthy, first
Watchmen. William J. Spangler, Watchman. Bruce L. Hudson, Maintenance. David E. Weiss, Cadet. Robert C. Rafferty, Steward. Alan G. Coleman, second to cook. Nolan F. Church, Porter. George J. Hall, Chief Engineer. Edward F. Bindon, First Assistant Engineer. Ripa, maintenance. Assistant engineer.
Ralph G. Walton, Euler. Thomas Benson, Euler. Joseph W. Mays, Maintenance. Gordon F. McClellan, Wiper. In remembrance of Gordon Lightfoot and all manners lost on the Great Lakes. Thank you, Kyle, very much. You know, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, Kyle uh, was recently promoted, and his aides to navigation team takes care of how many lighthouses in the area? 35. 35 lighthouses. Ours is one of them. Ours would be the best one, I think, that you take care of, right? <laughs> we. we... <laughs> yeah. We really appreciate the work that you do. Um, and. Uh, We'll be talking a little more, a little bit more about that in a few minutes as well. Um, now I'm going to uh, reintroduce uh, the Gordon Lightfoot tribute, and Mike, if you could introduce your band members as well. State in Detroit this evening, played with us last night at a concert in Canton, Michigan, and was able to come all this way up here. But uh, he's been here before and uh, wanted to be with us here in spirit tonight. We play this song with a lot of respect for the men that died, for the families that survived, and for the man that wrote this song, Gordon Lightfoot. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six.
Like it is said, never gives up her dead When the skies of November turn for me With a load of iron over 26,000 tons To the end of Fitzgerald way to be That good ship in the true love has a fault to be true When the gales of November came for me As the big freighters go, it was bigger than most, with a crew and a good captain, well seasoned. Including some terms with a couple of steel words, when they left the lead loaded for Cleveland. Later that night, when the ships go ready, could it be the north where they've been feeling? Sailors, the people. 
church bell chimed till it rang twenty-nine times. Reach man on the end of this chair. A bunch of clothes on from the chicken on one down. Up the middle of the day, oh, can't you believe? Superior so they said never gives up. When the game of the Some a little closer to home, some a little further away. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of 